Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. At the end of chapter four, Percy's mother had been dissolved by the monster in front of Percy's eyes. And Percy and Grover had run away and managed to escape. The last thing we, we remember is Percy collapsing on a wooden porch, holding Grover and two people looking down on him. One male, one female. So let's see what happens next. Chapter 5. I play pinochle with a horse. I had weird dreams full of barnyard animals. Most of them wanted to kill me. The rest wanted food. I must have woken up several times, but what I heard and saw made no sense, so I just passed out again. I remember lying in a soft bed, being spoon-fed something that tasted like buttered popcorn, only it was pudding. The girl with curly blonde hair hovered over me, smirking as she scraped drips off my chin with the spoon. When she saw my open eyes, she asked, What will happen at the summer solstice? I managed to croak. What? She looked around as if afraid someone would overhear. What's going on? What was stolen? We've only got a few weeks. I'm sorry, I mumbled. I don't... Somebody knocked on the door and the girl quickly filled my mouth with pudding. The next time I woke up, the girl was gone. A husky blonde dude, like a surfer, stood in the corner of the bedroom, keeping watch over me. He had blue eyes, at least a dozen of them, on his cheeks, his forehead and the backs of his hands. When I finally came around for good, there was nothing weird about my surroundings, except that they were nicer than I was used to. I was sitting in a deck chair on a huge porch, gazing across a meadow at green hills in the distance. The breeze smelled like strawberries. There was a blanket over my legs and a pillow behind my neck. All that was great, but my mouth felt like a scorpion had been using it for a nest. My tongue was dry and nasty and every one of my teeth hurt. On the table next to me was a tall drink. It looked like iced apple juice, with a green straw and a paper parasol stuck through a cherry. My hand was so weak I almost dropped the glass once I got my fingers around it. Careful, a familiar voice said. Grover was leaning against the porch railing, looking like he hadn't slept in a week. Under one arm he cradled a shoebox. He was wearing blue jeans, Converse high tops and a bright orange t-shirt that said Camp Half-Blood, just plain old Grover, not the goat boy. So maybe I'd had a nightmare. Maybe my mum was okay. We were still on vacation and we'd stopped here at this big house for some reason and... You saved my life, Grover said. I... well, the least I could do. I went back to the hill. I thought you might want this. Reverently, he placed the shoebox in my lap. Inside was a black and white bull's horn. The base jagged from being broken off. The tip splattered with dried blood. It hadn't been a nightmare. The Minotaur, I said. Um, Percy, this isn't a good idea. That's why they call it in the Greek myths, isn't it? I demanded. The Minotaur, half man, half bull. Grover shifted uncomfortably. You've been out for two days. How much do you remember? My mum, is she really? He looked down. I stared across the meadow. There were groves of trees, a winding stream, acres of strawberries spread out under the blue sky. The valley was surrounded by rolling hills and the tallest one directly in front of us was the one with the huge pine tree on top. Even that looked beautiful in the sunlight. My mother was gone. The whole world should be black and cold. Nothing should look beautiful. I'm sorry, Grover sniffled. I'm a failure. I'm, I'm the worst satire in the world. He moaned, stomping his foot so hard it came off. I mean, the converse high top came off. The inside was filled with styrofoam, except for a hoof-shaped hole. Oh, sticks, he mumbled. Thunder rolled across the clear sky. As he struggled to get his hoof back in the fake foot, I thought, well, that settles it. Grover was a satire. I was ready to bet that if I shaved his curly brown hair, I'd find tiny horns on his head. 
I was too miserable to care that satires existed, or even minotaurs. All that meant my mum really had been squeezed into nothingness, dissolved into yellow light. I was alone, an orphan. I'd have to live with... Smelly Gabe? No, that would never happen. I'd live on the streets first. I'd pretend I was 17 and join the army. I'd do something. Grover was still sniffling. The poor kid, poor goat, satire, whatever, looked as if he expected to be hit. I said, it wasn't your fault. Yes, it was. I was supposed to protect you. Did my mother ask you to protect me? No, but that's my job. I'm a keeper. At least I was. But why? I suddenly felt dizzy, my vision swimming. Don't strain yourself, Grover said. Here. He helped me hold my glass and put the straw to my lips. I recoiled at the taste because I was expecting apple juice, but it wasn't that at all. It was chocolate chip cookies. Liquid cookies. Not just any cookies. My mum's homemade blue chocolate chip cookies, buttery and hot with the chip still melting. Drinking it, my whole body felt warm and good and full of energy. My grief didn't go away, but I felt as if my mum had just brushed her hand against my cheek, given me a cookie the way she used to when I was small, and told me that everything was going to be okay. Before I knew it, I drained the glass. I stared into it, sure I'd just had a warm drink but the ice cubes hadn't even melted. Was it good? Grover asked. I nodded. What did it taste like? He sounded so wistful, I felt guilty. Sorry, I said. I should have let you have a taste. His eyes got wide. No, that's not what I meant. I just wondered. Chocolate chip cookies, I said. My mum's, homemade. He sighed. And how'd you feel? like I could throw Nancy Boba Fett a hundred metres. That's good, he said. That's good. I don't think you should risk drinking any more of that stuff. What do you mean? He took an empty glass from me gingerly, as if it were dynamite, and set it back on the table. Come on, Chiron and Mr D are waiting. The porch wrapped all the way around the farmhouse. My legs felt wobbly trying to walk that far. Grover offered to carry the Minotaur horn. But I held on to it. I paid for the souvenir the hard way. I wasn't going to let it go. As we came around the opposite end of the house, I caught my breath. We must have been on the north shore of Long Island, because on this side of the house the valley marched all the way up to Long Island Sound, which glittered about a mile in the distance. Between here and there, I simply couldn't process anything I was seeing. The landscape was dotted with buildings that looked like ancient Greek architecture, an open-air pavilion, an amphitheatre, a circular arena, except that they all looked brand new, their white marble columns sparkling in the sun. In a nearby sandpit, a dozen high school-age kids and satires played volleyball. Canoes glided across a small lake. Kids in bright orange t-shirts like Grover's were chasing each other around a cluster of cabins nestled in the woods some shot targets at an archery range. Others rode horses down a wooded trail. And unless I was hallucinating, some of their horses had wings. Down at the end of the porch, two men sat across from each other at a card table. The blonde-haired girl who'd spoon-fed me popcorn-flavoured pudding was leaning on the porch rail next to them. The man facing me was small but porky. He had a red nose, big watery eyes and curly hair so black it was almost purple. He looked like those paintings of baby angels. What do you call them? Hubbubs? No, cherubs, that's it. He looked like a cherub who turned middle-aged in a trailer park. He wore a tiger and patterned Hawaiian shirt. And he would have fitted right in at one of Gabe's poker parties, except I got the feeling that this guy could have outgambled even my stepfather. That's Mr D, Grover murmured to me. He's a camp director. Be polite. That girl... That's Annabeth Chase. She's just a camper, but she's been here longer than just about anybody. And you already know Chiron. He pointed at the guy whose back was to me. First, I realised who was sitting in the wheelchair. Then I recognised the tweed jacket, the thinning brown hair, the scraggly beard. Mr Bruner, 
I cried. The Latin teacher turned and smiled at me. His eyes had that mischievous glint they sometimes got in class when he pulled a pop quiz and made all the multiple choice answers be. All good, Percy, he said. Now we have four for Pinochle. He offered me a chair to the right of Mr D, who looked at me with bloodshot eyes and heaved a great sigh. Oh, I suppose I must say it. Welcome to Camp Half-Blood. There, now don't expect me to be glad to see you. Er, uh, thanks. I scooted a little further away from him, because if there was one thing I'd learned from living with Gabe, it was how to tell when an adult has been hitting the happy juice. If Mr D was a stranger to alcohol, I was a satire. Annabeth, Mr Bruner called to the blonde girl. She came forward and Mr Bruner introduced us. This young lady nursed you back to health, Percy. Annabeth, my dear, why don't you go and check on Percy's bunk? We'll be putting him in cabin 11 for now. Annabeth said, sure, Chiron. She was probably my age, maybe a couple of centimetres taller and a whole lot more athletic looking. With her deep tan and her curly blonde hair, she was almost exactly what I thought a stereotypical Californian girl would look like, except her eyes ruined the image. They were startling grey, like storm clouds, pretty but intimidating too, as if she were analysing the best way to be taken down in a fight. She glanced at the minotaur horn in my hands, then back at me. I imagined she was going to say, You killed a minotaur? Or, Wow, you're so awesome! Or something like that. Instead, she said, You drool when you sleep. Then she sprinted off down the lawn, her blonde hair flying behind her. So, I said, anxious to change the subject, You uh, work here, Mr Bruner? Not Mr Bruner, the ex-Mr Bruner said. I'm afraid that was a pseudonym. You may call me Chiron. Okay. Totally confused, I looked at the director. And Mr D, does that stand for something? Mr D stopped shuffling the cards. He looked at me like I just belched loudly. Young man, names are powerful things. You don't just go around using them for no reason. Oh, right. Sorry. I must say, Percy, Chiron Bruner broke in. I'm glad to see you alive. It's been a long time since I made a house call to a potential camper. I'd hate to think I've wasted my time. House call? My year at Yancey Academy to instruct you. We have satires at most schools, of course, keeping a lookout. But Grover alerted me as soon as he met you. He sensed you as something special. So I decided to come upstate. I convinced the other Latin teacher to, um, let's say, take a leave of absence. I tried to remember the beginning of the school year. It seemed like so long ago. But I did have a fuzzy memory of there being another Latin teacher my first week at Yancey. Then without explanation, he disappeared. Mr Bruner had taken the class. You came to Yancey just to teach me? I asked. Chiron nodded. Honestly, I wasn't sure about you at first. We contacted your mother, let her know we were keeping an eye on you, in case you were ready for Camp Half-Blood. But you still had so much to learn. Nevertheless, you made it here alive. And that's always the first test. Grover, Mr D said impatiently, are you playing or not? Yes, sir, Grover trembled as he took, took the fourth chair. I didn't know why you should be so afraid of a pudgy little man in a tiger print Hawaiian shirt. You do know how to play pinochle, Mr D eyed me suspiciously. I'm afraid not, I said. I'm afraid not, sir, he said. Sir, I repeated. I was liking the camp director less and less. Well, he told me, it is, along with gladiator fighting and Pac-Man, one of the greatest games ever invented by humans. I would expect all civilised young men to know the rules. I'm sure the boy can learn, Chiron said. Please, I said, what is this place? What am I doing here? Mr Brunt... Chiron, why would you go to Yancey Academy just to teach me? Mr D snorted. I asked the same question. The camp director dealt the cards. Grover flinched every time one landed in his pile. Chiron smiled at me sympathetically, the way he used to in Latin class, as if to let me know that no matter what average I was, I was his star student. He expected me to have the right answer. 
Percy, he said, did your mother tell you nothing? She said... I remembered her sad eyes looking out over the sea. She told me she was afraid to send me here, even though my father had wanted her to. She said that once I was here, I probably couldn't leave. She wanted to keep me close to her. Typical, Mr D said. That's how they usually get killed. Young man, are you bidding or not? What? I asked. He explained impatiently how you bid in Pinochle, and so I did. I'm afraid there's too much to tell, Chiron said. I'm afraid our usual orientation film won't be sufficient. Orientation film? I asked. No, Chiron decided. Well, Percy, you know your friend Grover is a satire. You know, he pointed to the horn in the shoebox, but you've killed a minotaur. No small feat either, lad. What you may not know is that great powers are at work in your life. Gods. The forces you call the Greek gods, they're very much alive. I stared at the others around the table. I waited for somebody to yell, not, but all I got was Mr D yelling. Oh, a royal marriage, trick, trick, he cackled as he tallied up his points. Mr D, Grover asked timidly, if you're not going to eat it, could I have your Diet Coke can? Eh? Oh, all right. Grover bit a huge shard out of the empty aluminium can and chewed it mournfully. Wait, I told Chiron. You're telling me there's such a thing as God. Well now, Chiron said. God, capital G, God, that's a different matter altogether. We shan't deal with the metaphysical. Metaphysical? But you were just talking about... Ah, gods, plural, as in great beings that control the forces of nature and human endeavours. The immortal gods of Olympus. That's a smaller matter. Smaller? Yes, quite. The gods we discussed in Latin class. Zeus, I said. Hera, Apollo, you mean them? And there it was again. Distant thunder on a cloudless day. Young man, said Mr D, I'd really be less casual about throwing those names around if I were you. But they're stories, I said. They're myths to explain lightning and the seasons and stuff. They're what people believed before there was science. Ha! <laughs> science, Mr D scoffed. And tell me, Perseus Jackson. I flinched when he said my real name, which I never told anybody. What will people think of your science 2,000 years from now, Mr D continued. Hmm? They will call it primitive mumbo jumble. That's what... Oh, I love mortals. They have absolutely no sense of perspective. They think they've come so far. And have they, Chiron? Look at this boy and tell me. I wasn't liking Mr D much. There was something about the way he called me a mortal, as if he wasn't. It was enough to put a lump in my throat, to suggest why Grover was dutifully minding his cards, chewing his soda can and keeping his mouth shut. Percy... Chiron said, you may choose to believe or not, but the fact is that immortal means immortal. Can you imagine for a moment never dying, never fading, existing just as you are for all time? I was about to answer off the top of my head that it sounded like a pretty good deal, but the tone of Chiron's voice made me hesitate. You mean whether people believed in you or not, I said. Exactly, Chiron agreed. If you were a god, how would you like being called a myth? An old story to explain lightning? What if I told you, Perseus Jackson, that some day people will call you a myth, just created to explain how little boys can get over losing their mothers? My heart pounded. He was trying to make me angry for some reason, but I wasn't going to let him. I said, I wouldn't like it, but I still don't believe in gods. Oh, you'd better... Mr. D murmured, before one of them incinerates you. Grover said, P please, sir, he's just lost his mother, he's in shock. A lucky thing too, Mr. D grumbled, playing a card. Bad enough I'm confined to this miserable job working with boys who don't even believe. He waved his hand and a goblet appeared on the table, as if the sunlight had bent momentarily and woven the air into glass. The goblet filled itself with red wine. My jaw dropped, but Chiron hardly looked up. Mr D, he warned, your restrictions. 
Mr D looked at the wine and feigned surprise. Oh dear me, he looked at the sky and yelled. Old habits. Sorry. More thunder. Mr D waved his hand again and the wine glass changed into a fresh can of Diet Coke. He sighed unhappily, popped the top of the soda and went back to his card game. Chiron winked at me. Mr D offended his father a while back, took a fancy to a wood nymph who'd been declared off limits. A wood nymph? I repeated, still staring at the Diet Coke can like it was from outer space. Yes, Mr D confessed. Father loves to punish me. The first time, prohibition. Ghastly. Absolutely horrid ten years. The second time, well, she was pretty and I couldn't stay away. The second time he sent me here, Half Blood Hill, summer camp for brats like you. Be a better influence, he told me. Work with yous rather than tearing them down. Ha! Absolutely unfair. Mr D sounded about six years old, like a pouting little kid. And I stammered, your father is... De immortalis, Chiron, Mr D said. I thought you taught the boy the basics. My father is Zeus, of course. I ran through D names in Greek mythology. Wine, the skin of a tiger. The satires that all seem to work here. The way Grover cringed as if Mr D was his master. You're Dionysus, I said, the god of wine. Mr D rolled his eyes. What do they say these days, Grover? Do the children say, well, duh? Yes, Mr D. Then, well, duh, Percy Jackson. Did you think I was Aphrodite, perhaps? You're a god. Yes, child. A god. You. He turned to look at me straight on. I saw a kind of purplish fire in his eyes, a hint that this whiny, plump little man was only showing me the tiniest bit of his true nature. I saw visions of grapevines choking unbelievers to death, drunken warriors insane with battle lust, sailors screaming as their hands turned to flippers, their faces elongating into dolphin snouts. I knew that if I pushed him, Mr D would show me worse things. He would plant a disease in my brain that would leave me wearing a straitjacket in a rubber room for the rest of my life. Would you like to test me, child? He said. No, 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 sir. The fire died a little. He turned back to his card game. I believe I win. Not quite, Mr D, Chiron said. He sat down a straight, tallied the points and said, this game goes to me. I thought Mr D was going to vaporise Chiron right out of his wheelchair, but he just sighed through his nose as if he was used to getting beaten by the Latin teacher. He got up and Grover rose too. I'm tired, Mr D said. I believe I'll take a nap before the sing-along tonight. But first, Grover, we need to talk, again, about your less than perfect performance on this assignment. Grover's face beaded with sweat. Y yes, sir. Mr D turned to me. Cabin 11, Percy Jackson. Mind your manners. He swept into the farmhouse, Grover following miserably. Will Grover be OK? I asked Chiron. Chiron nodded, but he looked a bit troubled. Old Dionysus isn't really mad. He just hates his job. He's been uh, grounded, I guess you would say. And he can't stand waiting another century before he's allowed back to Olympus. Mount Olympus, I said. You're telling me there really is a palace there? Well, now, there's Mount Olympus in Greece and then there's the home of the gods, the convergence point of their powers, which did indeed used to be on Mount Olympus. It's still called Mount Olympus out of respect to the old ways, but the palace moves, Percy, just as the gods do. You mean Greek gods are here, like in America? Well, certainly, the gods move with the heart of the West. The what? Come now, Percy, what you call Western civilization. Do you think it's just an abstract concept? No, it's a living force, a collective consciousness that has burned bright for thousands of years. The gods are a part of it. You might even say they're the source of it, or at least they are tied to it so tightly that they couldn't possibly fade not unless all of Western civilization were obliterated. The fire started in Greece. 
Then as you well know, or I hope you know since you passed my course, the heart of the fire moved to Rome. So did the gods. Oh, different names perhaps, Jupiter for Zeus, Venus for Aphrodite and so on. But the same forces, the same gods. And then they died. Died? No, did the West die? The gods simply moved to Germany, to France, to Spain for a while. Whenever the flame was the brightest, the gods were there. They spent several centuries in England. All you need to do is to look at the architecture. People do not forget the gods. Every place they've ruled for the last 3,000 years, you can see them in paintings, in statues, and on the most important buildings. And yes, Percy, of course, they're now in the United States. Look at your symbol, the eagle of Zeus. Look at that statue of Prometheus in the Rockefeller Centre, the Greek facades of your government buildings in Washington. I defy you to find any American city where the Olympians are not prominently displayed in multiple places. Like it or not, and believe me, plenty of people weren't very fond of Rome either, America is now the heart of the flame. It is the great power of the West, and so Olympus is here, and we are here. It was all too much, especially the fact that I seemed to be included in Chiron's we as if I were part of some club. Who are you, Chiron, and who am I? Chiron smiled. He shifted his weight as if he were going to get up out of his wheelchair, but I knew that was impossible. He was paralysed from the waist down. Who are you? he mused. Well, that's the question we all want answered, isn't it? But for now, you should get your bunk in cabin 11. There'll be new friends to meet. Plenty of time for lessons tomorrow. Besides, there'll be toasted marshmallows at the campfire tonight, and I simply adore them. And then he did rise from his wheelchair. There was something odd about the way he did it. His blanket fell away from his legs, but the legs didn't move. His waist kept getting longer, rising above his belt. At first, I thought he was wearing very long white velvet underwear. But as he kept rising out of a chair, taller than any man, I realised that the velvet underwear wasn't underwear, it was the front of an animal. Muscle and sinew under coarse white fur. And the wheelchair wasn't a chair. It was some kind of container, an enormous box on wheels. It must have been magic because there's no way it could have held all of him. A leg came out, long and knobbly kneed, with a huge polished hoof. Then another front leg, then the hind quarters. And then the box was empty, nothing but a metal shell with a couple of fake human legs attached. I stared at the horse who'd just sprung from the wheelchair, a huge white stallion. But where its neck should be was the upper body of my Latin teacher, smoothly grafted to the horse's trunk. Oh, what a relief, the centaur said. I've been cooped up in there so long my fetlocks had fallen asleep. Now, come, Percy Jackson, let's meet the other campers. And that's the end of chapter five. Maybe you can look up which god you think Chiron is after the end of that chapter. And I'm sure you'll find out the truth next time. Thank you for listening. For listening, for listening, for listening, for listening, for listening, for listening.